Welcome to regenerative braking. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what is regenerative braking, a little, you know, basically a little theory, a little operation, and we'll just touch on a little bit of diagnosis. But let's cover a few principles first. So basically, you know this, if a moving object has mass, it has inertia, right? Inertia is the resistance of an object to change its state of motion. And an object in motion tends to stay in motion, and an object at rest tends to stay at rest, unless acted upon by an outside force. You're like, what does this have to do with auto mechanics? We're getting there. But just again, think about that. If your car is cruising on the road, it took energy to get to that point, right? You went from having potential energy to kinetic energy, and then you're, you're cruising on the road. You need something, another energy force to act upon it, to slow down, to stop it. It's going to want to stay in motion uh, unless something else acts upon it. So... The uh, faster an object is accelerated, more force has to be applied to stop it. Likewise, it takes more force to start accelerating a heavier object. This seems kind of obvious, but um, that's just it's something we need to go over. Force equals mass times acceleration. So another equation, F equals MA. Remember Ohm's Law? We had uh, that whole uh, circle, uh, pi circle chart. Uh, this uh, works the same way. Okay, so... F on the top, M and A on the bottom. That's your mass and acceleration. The engine applies torque to turn the wheels, which, due to friction between the tires and the ground, causes the vehicle to propel. When standard brakes are applied, it's just a friction device that's applied to the disc or drums to stop the wheel from turning. We're transferring that energy into heat, right? So you know, you know that brakes get hot. Uh, they create heat, smoke, smells, whatever. All of that energy is being being um, turned into that. We're not creating or destroying energy, we're just transferring it. So the friction uh, between the tires and the ground is what stops the vehicle, and then here's that heat. So there's a little picture showing you an extreme situation of that heat. But basically it's not recovered, it's just lost. That energy is just gone. But up until now, nobody cared. So that's it. <clears throat> well, now people care. So reclaiming this energy in a hybrid. Uh, now, I'm going to use kind of the analogy of a fixie. So that's why you see a bicycle sprocket right there and a bike pedal, because it's going to be very similar to that. So think about a bicycle without a clutched hub. Um, if you've ever ridden a fixie bicycle, you know what I'm talking about. Basically, when you turn the crank sprocket uh, right here, the wheels turn. If the wheels turn, the crank it turns. If you're pushing on this pedal, that's the, the, the driving sprocket. Over here, being driven is the rear. That's the driven sprocket. But if you coast... The driven becomes a drive, and the driving becomes a driven. The energy goes backwards. If you've taken the transmissions class, you know what I'm talking about. If not, you'll uh, well, you'll hear about it then. But that's basically what's happening. So. so what we're trying to do is create a negative torque. Um, and again, it's going to be kind of hard to explain via PowerPoint, not there in class on a um, whiteboard, but I'm going to do my best uh, to do this. And the negative torque is basically what we're doing with regenerative braking. So if you think about that fixie again, if I'm cranking this sprocket, let's say according to this picture, we're going counterclockwise. I'm pushing down on the sprocket. This, this lever right here to the center of the sprocket is going to pull on this chain, this gear right here, and this chain is going to pull right up here to this littler gear right here. And what's going to happen on that rear wheel? It's going to pull forward also. So my torque, let's say counterclockwise is positive. That's a positive torque and a positive RPM. Right? So the rear wheel will have a positive torque, positive RPM. Follow? Well, now let's say this crank starts going down the road. If you want to stop a fixie bicycle, can you just hit the brakes? And if you've ridden one, you know that that's not true. Because if you stop, or if you slow down, this rear wheel is still turning, which means that sprocket's still turning, these pedals are still turning. So to slow down, you basically try to push on the pedals backwards. Now, again, they're not going backwards, but you're going to try and create resistance to them going forward. Okay, think of it that way. So what's going to happen is they're going forward but slower because you're trying to trying to give resistance and almost push backwards or slow down the movement of forward, but you're still going forward. So that's a negative torque, positive RPM. So see the difference there? Before, if I'm pushing on them forward and I'm going forward, that's a positive torque, positive RPM. If I'm trying to slow down that forward movement because I'm coasting and the rear wheel is driving this sprocket, and I'm trying to resist that forward motion, that's a negative torque. But nonetheless, I'm going forward. It's still a positive RPM. Okay, I'll show a chart in a little bit. <clears throat> so the purpose of regenerative braking is to convert this wasted mechanical energy, this energy that up until now nobody cared about, went to heat. Well, we want to store it for later use. Uh, use it in the, in the vehicle, charge the battery, uh, 
create better fuel mileage or extend range of our electric vehicle. We can recover about 20% of that energy that's normally wasted into heat and mechanical wear. Yeah, there is wear involved with the traditional brake systems. <clears throat> that's one of the pros we'll talk about regenerative braking. Uh, well, here we are. So reduce the drawdown of the battery charge, right? So the sign here, no gas, 82 miles, uh, not a problem. Extends the overall life of the battery pack, reduces fuel consumption, reduces mechanical wear of conventional brakes, uh, and it saves money. Well, that's all good things, right? So yeah, I've seen hybrid vehicles with factory installed pads go 100,000 miles. It just depends on your driving habit. If you're, you know, doing a lot of coasting and you're letting the regenerative braking slow you down, they're going to last a long time. If you're a digital driver as an on and off, or you drive a lot of low speeds, like think a gated community, then you'll wear your brake pads more. But the way it is right now, 82 miles, no problem. And of course, anytime you have a pro, that means you have a con, right? So must use special tires that are engineered to meet the demands of the extra friction and decreased rolling resistance requirements. If you took chassis, uh, a Doug's class, uh, um, the chassis steering suspensions, then you know when you talked about tires that there's the steel belts in there. When you rotate tires, you want those steel belts to relax. So think of this car as constantly not getting to relax. It's going to have to have a special tire that's going to allow that positive and negative torque constantly to go back and forth and decreased rolling resistance while maintaining a grippy um, compound of that tire. So very special tire. And if you don't put the correct tire on, you're going to see a decrease in um, miles per gallon, E miles per gallon, uh, or range, depending on what kind of vehicle you're driving, and grip. So not efficient under city driving conditions due to low speeds and short braking durations. That's why I was mentioning if you're in a gated community, um, that real low speed is just not enough to really benefit from that that magnetic field slowing you down on that transaxle. So not not as efficient then. Braking may be in balance because we're only braking on the axle with the magnet motor. So if we have a two-wheel drive vehicle. Now, only the front axle on a front-wheel drive, two-wheel drive vehicle is going to be slowing the vehicle down as you regen. Now, the cars going to, or advanced cars, are going to dynamically apply the hydraulic brakes, but that may not be the case. It depends on the car, and you could have an imbalanced feeling. Okay. Um, and I've had customers complain that they feel a slight surge or pulsation between transitioning between traditional hydraulic brakes and the regenerative braking. And that varies on speed between 5 and 20 miles per hour and state of charge. So all of that can change when the car is going to use traditional brakes or um, regenerative braking. So some cars are really, really sensitive too. Just keep that in mind. If somebody's borrowing a car or um, you haven't driven it in a while or they're not used to it, it's new, etc., they're gonna they could complain of a touchy, sensitive brake. Um, when in reality, everything's fine. It's just normal. Um, it's the way it is. So regenerative braking is basically, um, it's built into those, the inverter. So it's not a whole lot of hard parts extra. We are, most of the parts are already on the car. Um, we're just taking that kinetic energy uh, to potential energy and kinetic energy. We're transferring it back and forth. That's usually lost in heat. So again, a system requires min minimal mechanical or electrical changes to achieve this because everything's there. You remember in the previous lesson, I talked about motors and generators. In a motor, you're taking electrical energy to make a mechanical movement. In a generator, you're taking that mechanical movement to create electrical energy. So the parts are already there, but what we're doing is we're allowing that negative torque, the coasting of the tires and the gearing, to move that magnetic field to um, charge the battery, extend the range, etc. So most of it's software and algorithms. Um, it's actually quite impressive, too. So to use the electric motor as a generator, the rotor RPM must be faster than the stator frequency. And I'll talk about that with a supplement video. Normally I do this on the whiteboard, but um, again, I'm going to film myself uh, writing on a piece of paper. I'll talk more about how it actually creates this, this um, negative slip. Okay, so we'll go over slip later. <clears throat> and again, we'll, we'll cover this in the next video. Skip through some of this. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this too. Sorry about that. We'll have to move this and modify and adapt for remote learning. And I will, again, add a video. So look for the video of the Toyota Stator 
winding, and I'll talk more about negative slip and, and um, induction and permanent magnet regenerative braking operation then. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, yeah, that's a slip. I mean, this will be on the PDF if you want to read along. You can pull up the PDF and watch the video. It's up to you. Yep. So basically, what's going to happen here is as you create this negative torque, you're, you're turning the motor into a generator. That power <clears throat> that's generated in the stator winding is going to go through these flyback diodes to the battery. There's these diodes right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Much like on a, an alternator, right? You have your diode rectifier bridge. Uh, it's going to send that three-phase current back to the 12 volt battery. Well, in the hybrid system, same thing happens in the inverter. So as we generate that three-phase AC in the stator MG1, MG2, uh, or traction generator motor, depending on what vehicle you're looking at, that that electricity is going to come back through these diodes and go back to the high voltage battery. So basically, that's how asynchronous is. And this permanent magnet rotor, um, if I were to just let go of the brakes, what this screen is basically saying is if I were to just let go of the gas, let's say, right, and you're cruising, uh, you let go of the gas and you go to coast. Well, those, those wheels are turning that permanent magnet rotor in that stator winding, and that's going to create a massive amount of resistance. And that can actually be extremely, um, it can actually decelerate you at extreme rates. So the computer is going to balance this by turning the IGBTs on. That's the insulated gate bipolar transistors on the inverter. The computer will power that um, so that the net gain isn't that they're all the way fully on on regen. Like the, the motor isn't just fully off. They're going to power it on a little bit to kind of, again, like that fixie, slow down the process, but not just let go and let it just, you know, either slam you through the windshield or whatever. So... More on time means less regen, less on time means more regen, and the vehicle can control that um, via those IGBTs and flyback diodes. So if something were to fail, resulting in uncontrolled regenerative braking, excessive levels of current would be delivered to the battery, causing permanent damage and possible, possibly fire. So if this were to happen, all IGBT power switches turn on, effectively shorting the stator circuits, which keeps the damage to the stator only. And through heat, heat's going to damage this, but it's kind of a to help keep you from causing some serious permanent damage, fire, or uh, accident. So in a series regenerative braking system, now remember we talked about chassis configurations with the hybrids. You had series and parallel. Series meaning that you had the ICE as an onboard generator turning a, a MG1 or a generator a motor, and then that's going to create electricity to either store in the battery and or power MG2 traction motor to propel a vehicle. Well, on a braking system, the uh, amount of braking, the amount of regenerative braking is proportional to the brake pedal position. So as the brake pedal is pressed, the electric brake controller computes the torque needed to slow the vehicle and applies regen braking. Conventional service brakes are blended into regen if the brake pedal is applied further or faster or harder. So it kind of goes in series, kind of steps it up, right? So your, your average parallel hybrid vehicle probably has a series regenerative braking like the Prius. Okay, so all these all vehicles you, using the system utilize the electrohydraulic brake system, which includes the hydraulic control unit uh, that manages the brake cylinder pressures as well as front rear axle balancing. You're going to have the hydraulic control unit, the ECU. It's all part of the vehicle dynamic stability control. It's monitoring all of this. So. Uh, it's going to actively control the regen and or the tradi traditional hydraulic brakes as needed. So when you push on the brake pedal, the big difference here is you're pushing on a simulator, not the actual hydraulic system, unless there's a failure or emergency okay, uh, used by most manufacturers. So again, it's basically you push on, when you turn a key on, those solenoids will shut down and then it blocks off the system, the hydraulic system. So when you're pushing on your brake pedal, you're pushing on what's called a stroke simulator, and the computer computer is monitoring the pressure and how fast you're pushing it. In the event of failure, those solenoids are normally open, so if you lose power, they open up and you get traditional braking. So here's your overview of that system. Here's your pressure switches right here. And then we'll talk, bring this back up in the next video.